All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Can you turn to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1? 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. First John, 1 John chapter 1. 1 <laughs> John chapter 1, verse 1. You do that with your father, too. Never know. I might, might sound like I'm in a in a canyon or somewhere. All right, uh, you should be at First John chapter one verse one. We're going to be noting uh, the purpose of First John, and we'll be talking a little bit about uh, authorial intent, uh, authorial intention they call it, and um, author's intent, and uh, which is very. I've talked about it in the past. Uh, you might all want to shut your phones off because I haven't yet. So let me do that. Hold on a sec. I pull my microphone off my head. Oh boy, I think I was discombobulated because Cheyenne was showing me fi uh, pictures of her, you know how that thing, where they call it, they distort your face and everything? What's that called? Snapchat. Snapchat. Boy, that's for people who have, don't have much to do. <laughs> just, I just want to say, it's for people who don't have much to do, but it was pretty funny. She was making all the, they distort your face and everything. And I don't need to do that because my face is already... Got problems. So, anyways, what are you laughing over there? All right, thank you. I wouldn't. I wasn't bucking for a compliment. But compliment, by the way. So, anyways, now this thing's starting to bother me. Okay. All right. You should be at First John chapter one, verse one. We're going to be noting the purpose of First John here this evening. We're we're talking about the. Uh, we're, we're currently engaged in a introduction to First John, and we always do this. We talk in the introductions. Before we do any book, we start, have an introduction. Some introdu introductions are longer than others, um, depending on what the book is, the content of the book, uh, and problems with the book and interpretation. But uh, with the introduction, we've been noting the, uh, the canonicity of 1 John. Uh, we noted, what else did we note? Uh, we noted the, uh, not only the canonicity of this particular epistle, uh, but we've also uh, noted um, you know, the, the background uh, historical background of First John, and also the authorship of First John, and uh, and also we had a little uh, uh, a little biography on the Apostle John before Pentecost, the and after Pentecost. 
We noted who the recipients of 1 John were, and we noted the date of 1 John, uh, which was towards the end of the, uh, probably the last uh, decade of the first century. The recipients were to uh, Christians in the Roman province of Asia, because uh, that's where John spent the last uh, couple, uh, la at least the last decade of his life there. And uh, we also know the Apostle John himself, who was a disciple of Jesus, who, uh, he, you know, uh, he was the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, he is the, the, one, the author of the Gospel of John. He wrote 1 John as well as 2nd and 3rd John. We also noted uh, not only the date of 1 John and the recipients and the authorship and the canonicity of the book, but also the place of 1 John, which probably was written from Ephesus in the last decade of the first century. And then last evening we noted the literary genre or form of 1 John as well as the structure of 1 John. And we noted that the literary genre, it's a circular letter. It's not, uh, it doesn't have the typical... Greco-Roman features that you see in Paul's epistle, where he identifies himself and the, who he's writing to, and then he at the yeah, and then you have the body of the letter, and and then at the uh, at the end he has final greetings and whatnot, final benediction. Uh, we don't see that in First John, and uh, the reason why is because this church, uh, this epistle, was not simply directed at one particular church, like Paul wrote to Colossians, which we're studying on Sundays right now, but he wrote it to a, a group of churches. In fact, the entire Christian community in the Roman province of Asia, uh, which he was overseeing. So uh, then we noted the structure of 1 John, which has been a, a cause of uh, consternation among Bible scholars and interpreters of the book for, 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 for as long as the book's been around, 2,000 years. And uh, we've uh, noted that uh, John uh, Christopher Thomas was his name. I, I believe he's got, uh, and there's other people I've read that are in the same ballpark with him on regards to the structure of 1 John, namely that it's a, a built in a, uh, it's constructed with a, it has a chiastic construction, or in other words, inverted parallelism, or we could say the book mirrors itself. So we, we went through uh, uh, Thomas's uh, outline of the, of the epistle, which I'm pretty, uh, pretty much in agreement. There's some, I tweaked it in some certain areas as I saw fit, but he pr pretty much we followed it. And so we noted that last evening, that's very important when we come to understanding the thrust of the epistle, which uh, is to love one another. But uh, also, uh, in order to, uh, to, to study this book, we, wa we want to know what the purpose is. Uh, why did the writer write what he wrote? And uh, uh, what was the purpose of it? And we see this evening, there's there several purposes uh, that John has, but one overriding one, which he mentions in the prologue. And so uh, this is uh, going to tell us the author's intention. And that's very important because, uh, as I, I've said many times in the past, it's uh, being taught in your colleges and universities here in America and Western civilization. And uh, it all started more, really, really started to come about in the 60s, 1960s. And basically, the, uh, the text is, uh, the author's intent is, many believe, you can't get to that, especially when you come to the Bible, it's 2,000 years ago or, you know, or a lot older, you know, the, when the writer wrote it. And so you really can't be sure what his intentions were, what his purpose of writing and his intent. And, uh, of course, that's a joke, and uh, that's not true. And uh, we also, we'll talk about that, and um, also... Uh, you know, uh, they don't believe, so you, they don't believe, it, it, you can go to the text and there's a, there's a purpose or a meaning of the text outside uh, what the author wrote down. So that's pretty subjective and there's no uh, restrictions on your interpretation. You can make it anything you want it to be. It's kind of like the way people like, you know, a Beatles song, you know, well, Strawberry Fields Forever, what is that about? And people say, oh, it's, you know, it's anything, you know, you can make it anything you want to be. And, you know, Lennon would be going, yeah, sure, it's anything you would want it to be, you know. But that's not how we approach everyday life, do we? When we, you know, we don't look at the news and we don't look at the, uh, the, um, the, the newspaper or our boss's email or what a teacher wrote us on the board and, you know, and say, well, it's anything I want it to be. Uh, you, we can't live life like that. We'll get fired from our jobs. We'll fail in school. When the teacher or the, the boss or whatnot or the parent gives you, uh, writes down instructions, they know what they mean when they write them, unless they're on drugs and they're, or alcoholics or whatever, and they're not in their right mind. But when they write you down, you know what their intent is. It, they tell you. And it's no different than in the Bible and, and any other piece of work. They're even doing this. You know, when we talk about the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, I mean, there are people saying you can interpret it a whole bunch of different ways. Well, the original authors of those documents, they knew what that meant. And it's up to us 
to bridge the gap and figure out what that is. And it's irresponsible. And actually, I believe it is, uh, it is actually um, dishonest. It's academic dishonesty. It's just moral. It's, it's, it's sin, really. I mean, you're, you're misrepresenting what somebody said just to suit your own purposes. So it's just another manifestation of uh, being a sinner. So and being deceived by the devil, of course. So let's take a moment of silent prayer. And this is uh, before we get underway with this study of the purpose of First John. Let's take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves, to see if we're in fellowship with God. If uh, we, we need to confess our sins, uh, we're to do it immediately, confess the sins, and we're restored to fellowship with God. We maintain that fellowship by our obedience. And uh, so with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for this beautiful day in Iowa. It was in the 70s today, not a cloud in the sky. We just thank you so much for this unseasonably warm uh, weather here in Iowa in February. Uh, just uh, very, very, very thankful. And uh, I just thank you, Father, for uh, all the blessings that we have as being citizens of these United States. We thank you for our military and political leaders, uh, all those in authority which uh, come from you and are serving are your servants, whether they realize it or not. And we just uh, pray for our military and political leaders. We pray that you give them the wisdom and the moral courage to lead this country. We pray, Father, that you would convict the church, remind the church, and encourage the church to pray for their leaders as they're commanded to do in your word in First Timothy chapter 2, and help us to uh, follow the example of, uh, of uh, your son and the apostles who uh, prayed uh, for, the, for the leaders, the civil authorities, and we just... Uh, Pray, Father, thank you, Father, for also all the logistical grace blessings that you've given to us, the, the food, shelter, the clothing, the jobs that we have, the schools that we go to, the ch our children, our parents, uh, with our salaries. We just thank you, for our businesses. We thank you, Father, for the homes that we live in and all the luxuries that we have and the, the heat and the hot water and the showers and indoor plumbing. And we just take these things for granted so much. We just thank you so much for these things. Uh, we just thank you, Father, for your word and our relationship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the great sacrifice of your, that you uh, demonstrated at the cross of Calvary and the great sacrifice of your Son and dying for us on the cross while we were yet your enemies. We just thank you so much for, for that and also raising him from the dead for our justification. We also thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, from regeneration to resurrection in, in particular, uh, the baptism of the Spirit and identifying us with your Son, Jesus Christ, and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at your right hand, and placing us thus under his headship and under the new humanity of which he is the head. We thank you, Father, for delivering us from eternal condemnation, giving us the forgiveness of sins, and delivering us from spiritual and physical death, as well as sin and Satan, bondage to those two domains. We just thank you, Father, for all these things and help us uh, and encourage us to appropriate by faith this identification with your son and consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and the cosmic system of Satan and alive to you, Father, so that we can experience this deliverance now and in time and enjoy fellowship with you. We thank you for this uh, study in First John. We pray that you would bless us this evening in this study. We pray that you would help all those in the audience by the power of the Spirit to understand, to concentrate, and to make application of what they're being taught. We pray, Father, that uh, also that you would uh, help myself to communicate accurately your word to your people, rightly dividing the word of truth and bringing forth your full counsel to your people with boldness and accuracy and clarity and reverence and respect for your word. 
We pray that you would help Cheyenne with the sound and recordings. We thank you for her service, the technology, and the people taking advantage of the technology, uh, whether it's live right now through the website or a later date through the recordings on the website. We thank you for each and every one of these individuals and the technology. So, Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're going to be, as I said before, the opening prayer, noting for the purpose of 1 John. And as I also said, it actually contains a fourfold purpose, uh, which is reflected by the statements in 1 John 1.4, 1 John 2.1, 1 John 2.26, and 1 John 5.13. However, the first of these contains the overall purpose for the epistle. So we have basically a fourfold purpose with one overriding purpose, which actually sums up the other purposes. I'll show you. It's kind of interesting what he does. And so uh, there's several, uh, several there's, a, uh, there's a phrase that John uses in 1 John, which cues us in that he's giving us one of the reasons or the purposes for writing this epistle. Uh, he, you'll see him in, his, in 1 John 1, 4. These things we write. Or 1 John 2, 1. We'll see all these tonight. These things we write. These things I have written in 1 John 2, 26. And then these things I have written in 1 John 5, 13. All of these, fra the, each of these phrases points back to the preceding context and uh, to the statements in the preceding context. And so these, uh, when he uses this phrase, these expressions, and you compare it with what he said in the previous context, he's giving you a purpose, one of the purposes for which he is writing this epistle. So the fourfold purpose of 1 John, first of all, is to secure the joy of the believers John is writing to. Secondly, this epistle is to assure these believers that they have a provision for sin when they do sin, and thus they, uh, to ensure, assure them that they have eternal security. Thirdly, John wanted to protect his readers from false doctrine by encouraging them to continue in the doctrine he taught them. And lastly, uh, the apostle wanted to assure, reassure his readers that they possess eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ, his son. However, as I also pointed just a few moments ago, John's overall purpose is revealed in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and that John wants his readers to continue to obey his apostolic message so as to protect their fellowship with God, which would bring him great joy. So that is what we're going to look at here this evening, this fourfold purpose and the overriding purpose. So if you could look at 1 John chapter 1 verse 1, I'm going to read from the Net Bible and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and look at these things. It says in 1 John uh, chapter 1 verse 1 in the Net Bible, this is what we proclaim to you, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and our hands have touched. Concerning the word of life, and the life was revealed, and we have seen and testify and announced to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. And he's speaking, of course, that Jesus Christ is it, uh, the eternal life of God incarnate. He's the perfect embody, he's the human, he's the personal embodiment of eternal life and all the attributes of God, because he is the Son of God and human flesh. Verse 3, what we have seen and heard we announce to you too so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So there's the overriding uh, purpose of the epistle. Then he says in verse 4, which confirms this, what he says in verse 4 confirms this, thus, we're writing these things. Why? So that our joy may be complete. So he's writing uh, to these things to, in the, uh, in the, uh, about Jesus Christ, to protect their fellowship with God, because if they didn't uh, agree that Jesus Christ is the God-man, they wouldn't have fellowship with God. Uh, they would be uh, out of fellowship with God, because fellowship with God is based upon the, the person of Jesus Christ. And if you deny that he's the Son of God and a human being, you're denying his person, and they're the means by which you and I have fellowship. And he says, these things, we're, write, we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete or to, uh, uh, be, uh, to the maximum. So uh, we see there, when he says, these things we write in verse 4, that points back to John's statements in, verse, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. So therefore we can see that the first purpose is to first to secure the joy of the believers John is writing to. All right? And the, and the overriding one, as he just said, is so that they could continue to have fellowship with God. 
But the, fir uh, the first purpose is if, if, when he says, these things I, have, uh, uh, I write in, in 1 John 1, 4, it's pointing back to 1 John 1, 3. And what, was he, what, did, what did he say in verse 4? So that our joy may be complete. We have mutual joy. Uh, we're, in, in, we're having uh, God, the Holy Spirit. We're having the joy of the Lord. We're experiencing it by having fellowship with God. So that's uh, the one reason why John is writing this particular epistle. Then uh, the phrase, these things we write in 1 John 2, 1, points back to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 10. So if you could, look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. He says, now this is the gospel message we have heard from him. And of course, he's speaking of Jesus Christ, John is. And announced to you, God is light. And as we'll see, when we study it, it's a figure for his holiness. And in him, there's no darkness at all. Uh, that, the fact that that interpretation that God is light is speaking of his holiness is uh, confirmed by when he says the, there's no darkness in him at all. So that's speaking, there's no sin in God. Okay, so we're talking about the holiness of God when we speak of the light, that God is light. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet keep on walking in the darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we do not bear the guilt of sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, forgiving us our sins, and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, chapter 2, verse 1, no uh, chapter break in the originals. The Net Bible does a good job of putting verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2 with 1 John 1, 5 through 10. My little children. I'm writing these things to you. What things? The things he just said in verses 5 through 10 of chapter 1. I'm writing, things, writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself, Jesus Christ, is the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the entire world. So... When these things we write in 1 John 2, 1, points back to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, and that gives us the second purpose. This epistle was to assure uh, these believers in the Roman province of Asia that they have a provision for sin when they do sin, and thus they have eternal security. Sin can only cut off their fellowship with God. It doesn't sever their eternal relationship with God. There's a difference. Fellowship flows from this eternal relationship, but uh, sin does not cut off uh, the, sever the rela eternal relationship between the believer and God when the believer sins. It just cuts off their fellowship, and, this, and it's restored through the confession of sin. So he's trying to reassure his readers, in other words, that they have eternal security, and that there is a provision for sin, Jesus Christ, because he's the propitiation for their sins, and... He sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for the believer when Satan accuses them at the throne of God. And he's the believer's advocate, uh, his uh, friend that steps in for, uh, for them. And not to uh, tell sweet things to God the Father about us, but basically he's just telling, you know, he comes forward because it's a reminder to Satan, really, that uh, Jesus Christ died for our sins. So when Satan wants to accuse us of something we did, Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father and says, hey, I died for that sin, whatever this sin is. So uh, we cannot, our eternal relationship cannot be severed because of committing sin. It does uh, knock us out of fellowship, but we're restored through the confession of sin, and we maintain that fellowship by our obedience. Now, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, the phrase, these things I have written in the New American Standard, very similar in the other translations, that phrase in 1 John 2, 26, points back to John's statements in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. And thus, it reveals the third purpose, which is John wanted to protect his readers from false doctrine by encouraging them to continue in the doctrine, the apostolic teaching that he had taught them, which he's reminding them about in this particular epistle. So here's the third purpose. 
He's trying to protect his readers from false doctrine. And we see this in our study in Colossians. In fact, it's kind of interesting. The Judaizers who Paul was dealing with in Colossians, uh, the threat against Colossae was the Judaizers, as we can see. But they, as we pointed out, had an incipient form of Gnosticism. The same Gnosticism that John's dealing with uh, here in 1 John at the end of the first century. Paul was dealing with this incipient, this uh, form of Gnosticism in its infancy in between 60 and 62 AD. John's in the last decade when he writes 1 John, and here he is facing the same uh, issues. Colossae was in the Roman province of Asia. John is in the Roman province of Asia when he wrote 1 John. This proto-Gnosticism, incipient form of Gnosticism, which we're going to talk about in detail tomorrow, uh, is... Uh, it, it was a uh, the problem there, and, and and John was dealing with Paul had to deal with it. Paul had to deal with it in relation to the the Judaizers who were trying to put people under the law. Uh, there's no indication that John was dealing with Jewish people here that were uh, in, uh, like Paul was in Colossae. There's no indication of any Jewish influence there among these false teachers. As we read First John, there's no indication of that. Unlike Colossians chapter two, where Paul gives great indications that he was dealing with people who were Jewish and were involved in this incipient form of Gnosticism. And we'll see this tomorrow. And Gnosticism, it didn't become a full-blown threat to Christianity until the second century uh, uh, AD, in the midway point of it. And Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers, writes a great deal about them. We'll probably talk, take a, uh, read a quote from him tomorrow. He talks a lot about these people. They basically were an amalgamation of Christian thought, ideas, some of the Bible, but also may, uh, quite a bit of uh, Greek ph uh, philosophy, uh, Greek philosophy or you know, all types of philosophy. It was an amalgamation of that. That's what made them dangerous because they would quote the Bible and misinterpret it, uh, just like Satan would do, and uh, m abuse the word of God. And uh, so they put God, words in God's mouth. Now, here's the thing. Uh, this uh, this uh, Gnosticism, they believe that uh, achieving uh, knowledge uh, was going to bring about your salvation, not the personal work of having faith in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross as the, the means of uh, 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 receiving eternal salvation. They believe that acquiring knowledge was the way to do it. So uh, they, are, they, they were quite a, bit, uh, quite a big threat to Christianity, uh, definitely by the midway point of the second century AD. Uh, in, the, in, Paul, in Paul's day, in the 60s of the first century, and in John's day, at the end of the first century, they were both dealing with an incipient form of Gnosticism. John was actually probably dealing with the worst form of it because it has developed quite a bit. And uh, his, his, um, what he says in this epistle kind of gives us a, an indication um, how bad it was and the nature of the heresy. They, they were involved, uh, as we'll see tomorrow, in a descetic form of Gnosticism, meaning they denied that Jesus Christ was a human being. Here's the other thing I wanted to mention. You talk about Gnosticism. You've ever heard, when we studied this in canonicity, the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Judas. You know, these, why aren't these books in the Bible? Or, and the, or the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, must, there's a conspiracy to keep these books out. We saw that that's a fallacy, that's a joke, that's not even historically accurate. Uh, they weren't accepted in the canon of Scripture because... They had no connection to the apostles. They are historically inaccurate. In fact, if you read these books, you'll see why they never were accepted by the church. The church never put, accepted uh, uh, Gospel of Thomas or Gospel of Judas into their writings. They had never found in the early catalogs of the church fathers uh, when they, put, when they, when they uh, identified what books they considered as inspired by God. Those books were never involved. And they were written, the reason why, they were written in the second century. And uh, they were Gnostic documents. Uh, you might hear in the news, the Nag Hammadi Library, and it was in Egypt, and they found all these Gnostic works, in which uh, 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 liberal, scholars, liberal scholars, when I say liberal scholars, uh, they deny the supernatural. Uh, they, liberal scholars that you see on the History Channel, and at Easter and all that, and they question uh, the uh, the the, uh, the canon of scripture and the and also the person of Christ all these sort of things. But it's interesting in the first century with this ascetic Gnosticism, they didn't deny that Jesus was God. They denied that he was a human being, which is quite different from what we think about Jesus. In some instances, we don't even think he was a human being, a historical person, which is another amazingly uh, ridiculous thing to say because historically that's not true. 
We have tons of evidence for Jesus. We have more historical artifacts, written documents, copies of the New Testament, and secular writers which affirm the historicity of the person of Jesus of Nazareth. You can't deny it. He's even, he's even mentioned in the Roman writings, and they were no friends of Christianity. Okay? But we see that, uh, uh, that uh, when we talk, about Jesus, uh, we talk about the person of Christ, uh, we deny his deity, but, we will not, but back then in the first century, it was their humanity that they denied. And the reason why these Gnostics did that is because they thought that, uh, that if Jesus became, if the Son of God became a, a human being, uh, then he would be evil. He would have evil in him too because they said that uh, they, they looked at matter, the Gnostics did, as being inherently evil. Of course, Jesus didn't have a human father. His, his Mary impregnated Mary, so he didn't have the presence of the sin nature in him. But uh, they, they, they believed that God could not become a human being because they looked at matter as evil, okay? The, the body as evil. And it, it spawned all kinds of crazy things, as we'll talk about tomorrow. So uh, we see that uh, John wanted, as we looked at, as we just pointed out to you, uh, in 1 John 2, 26, when John says, these things I have written, that's pointing, when he says that, he's pointing back to his statements in 1 John 2, 18 through 24. And that reveals the third purpose of this epistle. John wanted to protect his readers from false doctrine by encouraging them to continue in the apostolic teaching, the ap sound doctrine he was teaching them and had been teaching them and was teaching them and reminding them of in this epistle. So if you could, look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. 1 John 2, 18. First John two, First John two eighteen. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, the one who'll come from the revived form of the Roman Empire, he'll be a Roman, as we pointed out in the book of Daniel, Daniel seven and Daniel nine, and so then he says, so now many Antichrists have appeared. We know that from this that it is the last hour that these false teachers, Antichrist simply means they're uh, they're against Christ because they're teaching. Uh, they're not representing him. They're not following the apostolic testimony that he was both God and man, which John communicates in the prologue. We just read. We have heard. We have touched. We have seen with our own eyes, seen with our, uh, touched with our hands, the word of life, Jesus Christ. He's both God and man. So he says in verse 18, children, it's the last hour. And just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have appeared. We know from this that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. Because if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But they went out from us to demonstrate that all of them do not belong to us. Nevertheless, you have an anointing from the Holy One. It's the Holy Spirit. It's indwelling them. And you all know, I have not written to you that you do not know the truth, but that you do know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar, and these are the, what the Antichrists do, but the person who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This one is the Antichrist, the person who denies the Father and the Son. If you deny that Jesus is both God and man, you're denying the Father because the Father sent him. Everyone who denies the Son does not have the Father either. The person who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, what you have heard from the beginning, this teaching about Jesus, must remain in you. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. I think in the most, a lot of English translations, like the New American Standard, the word that the Net Bible translates, remain, they translate abide. It's the verb meno. And remain is our right. The idea, as we'll say uh, uh, next week, he's taking this language, this word meno, from Jesus' language in the upper room discourse in the vine and the branches metaphor. Uh, every, every branch that remains in me, meno, abides on me will have fellowship with me, will bear fruit. So he says in verse 24, he says, as for you, what you have heard from the beginning must remain in you, this teaching of his. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you will also remain in the Son and the Father. You'll have fellowship with them. Now this is the promise that he himself made to us, eternal life. Then he says in verse 26, these things I've written to you, what things? 
what we just read in verses 18 through 25. These things I've written to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So there, if we look at, if we compare that statement there in verse 26 with what he just said in verses 18 through 25, there's the third purpose. John wanted to protect his readers from the false doctrine taught by these, uh, these Gnostic teachers. Now, lastly, we have another, uh, the fourth, a fourth purpose. Uh, if you look at 1 John 5.13, the phrase, these things I have written, points back to his statements in 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. Lastly, so that would mean that that fourth purpose is that Paul, or excuse me, John, wanted to reassure his readers that they possess eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. How do we, how do we get that? These things I've written in 1 John 5, 13 points back to his statements in 1 John 5, 6 through 12. If you look at those statements with what he says in verse 13, the fourth purpose is John wanted to reassure his readers that they do possess eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. That means implicitly reject the teaching of the Gnostics. They, they're not living an eternal life. If they're believers, they're out of fellowship with God. If they're unbelievers, they don't possess it. But you do because of your faith in Jesus Christ. So look at 1 John 5, 13, uh, 5, 6, please. I think I'll start you there. Yeah, let's... Uh, yeah, look at uh, verse 5. We'll start there. 1 John 5, 5. 1 John 5, 5. This is the, uh, 1 John 5, 5. Now, who is the person who has conquered the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Jesus Christ is the one who came by water and blood, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three are in, are in agreement. If we accept the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, because this is the testimony of God, that he has testified concerning his son. The one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God, has, has, believe God has made him a liar, God a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has testified concerning his son, which the testimony comes through the spirit, through the apostles. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. The one who has the son has this eternal life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have this eternal life. Then verse 13, I have written these things. What things? The things we just read. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know. And the word know there, oida, it's talking about uh, something that you know without a doubt, know for certain, that you have eternal life. So he's reassuring his readers that, he is, uh, that they have eternal life and it's through faith in Jesus Christ. So there we have the, fir the fourfold purpose. Let, let me review it. When he says these things, we write in 1 John 1, 4, that points back to John's statements in 1 John 1, 3. Then he writes, when he writes these things, we write in 1 John 2, 1, points back to 1 John, you don't have to do that right now. 1 John 2, 1, these things we write, points back to 1 John 1, 5 through 10. And so, uh, let me back it up. When he says in 1 John 1, 4, by way of review, these things we write in 1 John 1, 4, it points back to John's statements in 1 John 1, 3. So there we see the first purpose is John wants to secure the joy of the believers John is writing to. Then, as we just pointed out and read, in 1 John 2, 1, these things we write points back to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. So that would mean the second purpose is that John wants to assure these believers that they have a provision for sin when they do sin, and thus eternal security. Then in verse John 2.26, these things I've written, it points back to his statements in 1 John 2.18-24. John, what that means is the third purpose is that John wants to protect his readers from false doctrine by encouraging them to continue in the doctrine he taught them. And then lastly, 
These things I have written, as we just read in 1 John 5, 13, points back to his statements in 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. So therefore, the, for, the fourth purpose is that John wants to reassure his readers that they possess eternal life through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. However, as I also pointed out earlier, at the beginning of the service, John's overall purpose is revealed in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the sense that John wants his readers to continue to obey his apostolic message so as to protect their fellowship with God, and this would bring him joy. Now, in these verses, there's an author-centered purpose, meaning that John sought to benefit by his readers continuing to obey his apostolic teaching. It would give him great joy that they continue to obey his teaching. In, in, in this teaching in his epistle and follow the apostolic teaching and continue to reject the false doctrine of the Gnostics. So that's an author-centered purpose. He, he, he sought to benefit by his readers continuing to obey his apostolic teaching. In what sense would he benefit? It would give him great joy. There is also, of course, an audience-centered purpose, we could say, meaning that John sought for his readers to benefit from fellowship with God. So John would benefit by their obeying his teaching, and it would give him joy. His audience would benefit uh, by this, by obeying his teaching, and that they would continue to experience regularly fellowship with God. So therefore, there are actually two interrelated purposes reflected in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. If you could, go back there. Look at 1 John 1, 1 again. First John 1 John 1.1, this is what we proclaim to you, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, and our hands have touched, concerning the word of life. And the life was revealed, and we have seen and testified and announced to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. That's the, that's the apostolic testimony of John and others who were eyewitnesses to the historicity the person of Jesus Christ as being both God and man. But Gnostics are saying he's not a human being. John's saying, we saw him. We heard him. We touched him. Don't tell us he's not a human being. We saw him bleed. We saw him die physically. And we saw him raised from the dead. We're eyewitnesses. There tells you again, Christianity, biblical Christianity, is not a blind faith. It's based upon evidence and witnesses. The witnesses are the apostles and the disciples of Jesus. The eyewitness testimony has been put down in the New Testament documents and the gospels and the epistles. So uh, it's not, so we, unlike Buddhism, unlike Hinduism, and unlike all the religions of the world, biblical Christianity has actually, a, 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 it's historical. Uh, not, these other religions are not historical. Um, Islam is not. It's on the testimony of one man, Muhammad. And so the Bible says you're not to accept the testimony of somebody on a particular matter unless there's two or more witnesses. Well, we have multiple uh, authors of the, of the Bible, Old and New Testament, over 40 authors from various ba backgrounds. Some were fishermen, some were kings, some were... Uh, uh, some were uh, uh, not only kings, uh, 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 fishermen, uh, there were some who were rabbis like Paul, uh, Pharisees, all different walks of life, all different types of people, and from different historical uh, 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 times. And they all agree. They all, uh, everything that they write is pointing to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They have their central focus. So, uh, you have multiple uh, authors and, and over, over 2,000 years, 2,500 years, the, the, both Old and New Testament, and they agree in their testimony. Whereas Islam, you got Muhammad, and that's about it. That's all. That's not my opinion. That's the truth. That's, that, ask them who you think they wrote their scriptures. One man. So you have Christianity is historical. It's based upon historical facts, evidence. And I told you this before, you have to get this down, especially you guys going to college, because you're going to have, all, every time Dick and Harry thinks he knows what he's talking about, and criticizing or taking a shot at the New Testament or the Old Testament documents. Nowhere, nowhere has anybody ever in history, since they were written, has found any 
cause to dis, uh, to not ex, um, trust the historic, historical information in the two New Testament documents. They've been found to be reliable and they've been cr- scrutinized like more than any of the written uh, uh, documents, uh, art- artifacts of any religion. Nobody comes close to the Bible and it being scrutinized. Not the Quran, but the Bible is the most scrutinized book because, well, it should be because of the claims it makes. And so we see the his- New Testament documents, Old Testament documents have been pro- proven historically reliable, meaning what's recorded in them cannot be, there's never been anybody to say, oh, we found this is inaccurate. There are people who will say, we believe this is inaccurate, but it has been proven that they were wrong, that they, it was inaccurate. So you have 2,000 years, especially ever since the Enlightenment, the last 300, 400 years, people taking shots at it, scholars, but they haven't found anything. Uh, they used to think that uh, Luke, uh, very famous, uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke and Acts were historically inaccurate. Well, uh, there was a man named Sir William Ramsey, an archaeologist, who became a Christian because he wanted to find out if this was true. And he came away saying, no, you, the New Testament documents are historically reliable. And he became a Christian because of it. So uh, that's very important because when we talk about Jesus, we're getting information about Jesus from documents that have been proven sound and reliable. Anybody can take a criticism of the New Testament, but does the criticism stick? And nothing stick into it. People make accusations, but over time, they've been refuted. It happens all the time. It's been happening for 2,000 years. You know, it's, you know, we talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found another cave. You know, people don't know this, the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a lot of things. First of all, you talk about the Dead Sea Scroll in the Old Testament. They basically affirm that the Old Testament that we have, the documents that we have, are uh, reliable because those Dead Sea Scrolls have copies of the Old Testament, okay, a thousand years before Christ. In fact, a thousand years before the, the, the earliest documents of the Hebrew Old Testament that we have, which is like in the 5th, 6th century A.D. or 9th century A.D. The, text, the, the copies of the Old Testament that we have, Hebrew, in the 9th century, in the 5th, 6th century, is very much, pretty much identical to what we have a thousand years before Christ in those Dead Sea Scrolls. So basically, we can count on the historical reliability of the Old Testament as well. Those Dead Sea Scrolls affirm the historical reliability of those documents. So we can say that when John says what he says here, we can believe it. We can believe that these things are accurate. Like, uh, for instance, um, you know, people talk, I, I, I've had this, I've run into this with family members. People say, well, it's so long ago, and how can you, you know, how can you believe? I said, do you, do you believe that Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar existed? Do you believe that the Roman Empire existed? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, there's more. This is not my opinion. Count the documents. There's more historical written artifacts for the existence of Jesus and the apostles uh, than there is for Gaius Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great. It's minimal. It's, it's like the comparison. It's not, there's no comparison. We have, a, we have a handful of documents that nobody will ever question about, you know, it says Alexander the Great was the ruler of the world and or we have uh, Gaius Julius Caesar in the Roman Empire. We don't question that. But we question the historical reliability of the New Testament documents, and Jesus was a historical person. And yet, we, well, there's more evidence for Jesus being a historical person. T- um, thousands and thousands of documents, copies of the New Testament manuscripts, secular writings that were not friends of Christianity, than we do of Gaius Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great or Nebuchadnezzar or any of these ancient rulers. See, they have a double standard, okay? The, the liberal does. When I say liberal, I mean not politics. I'm talking about somebody who denies the supernatural, which would be I deny the Bible's supernatural book, and I deny that Jesus is God. Okay? So John's saying, what John's saying here is pretty heavy stuff here. Then he says in verse 3, What we've seen and heard we announce to you too, so that you may have fellowship with us. That's the overriding uh, purpose here in this epistle. And indeed, our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John's trying to protect the fellowship of his readers. 
And God, the Holy Spirit, wants to do that with us in this church. And this is why he get, this book is still with us today. It serves, it's inspired by God. It's a part of the canon of scripture. It's, benefit, it's beneficial for us in our walk with God. If we learn and apply it, we'll, have our, we'll continue to have fellowship with God. Now, as we just pointed out, and I just proved to you, this writer, John, has a particular purpose for writing. We can gauge what his intent is, his authorial intent, they call it, the purpose of writing. Today's day and age, people say you can't, you couldn't, you can't determine that. Uh, you can't determine that. Well, we just found out, just from our English translations, yes, you can. And this goes for pretty much every book of the all, all book, every book of the Bible. And so when people tell you you can't be sure of the purpose of the author's intent, you have to reject that because you just saw for yourself that that's not true. Some people think you can't come. So that's why you look at, um, and this, here's the other implication here. If we know what John's saying, okay, here, and his intent, his purposes, when we go to interpret the Bible, we shouldn't be standing, sitting around a circle and then taking our shot as what we think it means. No, John's telling you what he means. It's up to us to figure out and, li and pay attention and be disciplined enough and read it and find out what John's intention is or writing. It's not what we think it is. Our opinions are meaningless. You know, we live in a culture where everybody gives an opinion, even for things they don't even know about. And I just love that when people try to they'll talk, about the, they'll talk about the Bible and you, I'm sitting there and they know I'm a pastor and they know I'm doing this. And I say, and you just, it, I mean, I get it all the time. And they talk as if they're an authority on the subject. They don't have a clue what the Bible says at all, but they just like to spout off as an opinion because that's what we do in this culture. We're so arrogant and full of ourselves. Everybody has an opinion. You know, we never hear anybody on a talk show say, I really don't know. I can't give you a, uh, I'm not very well read on the subject, so I can't give an opinion on it. We don't have people like that doing that often because everybody likes to give their opinion to make themselves look like they're something that they're not, you know? And we do this with entertainers. They don't know what they're talking about, politics, half of them. Some of them do. Some of them are involved deep, deeply, or you know, whatever the subject is. You know, it's not what we, our opinion's meaningless. We want to know what John says, stick to what the text says, and not what we think it says. And because when we don't, when we don't stick to the author's intent, his purposes, the meaning, the, what he means in the epistle, then what's going to happen is there's no, there's no controls on the interpretation. You can never come. You can never come to a, a conclusion as to what the text says. Um, there's a man. Um, uh, there's a man named Hirsch, E. D. Hirsch Jr. Uh, he he uh, he actually says he has the following precepts. This, this is what he says: verbal meaning is whatever someone, usually the author, has will to convey by a particular sequence of words, and that it can be shared by means of lingu linguistic signs. The author's, number two, the author's true intention provides the only genuinely discriminating norm for ascertaining valid or true interpretations from invalid and false ones. It's just what I just told you, but he did it a little bit more eloquently. Basically, the author's intention is the only, we, once we find out, that's the only way we can determine what's a false interpretation or a val a, a, an invalid one, or a valid one. So, the first objective, he says, of hermeneutics is to make clear the text's verbal meaning, not its significance. Meaning is that which is represented by the text, and what an author meant to say by the linguistic signs represented. Letters, and that's what he means by linguistic signs. Significance, by contrast, names a relationship between that meaning and a person, concept, situation, or any other possible number of things. Number four, and this is what I want to concentrate uh, uh, end with the meaning of a text cannot change but its significance can and does change if meaning were not determinate then there would be no fixed norm by which to judge whether a passage was being interpreted correctly so that's the end of the quote so what, I'm, what he's saying is if we get away from the author's intent and don't know the purposes of his writing and we don't we don't stick to it then there's no there's no there's no controls on the interpretation it's all subjective. When you stick to what the author is saying and the meaning of his words and the purposes of what, for which he's writing or the purpose for which he's writing and, and stick to what he has to say, 
that controls our interpretation. It keeps us from get, having these crazy interpretations, which happens all the time when it comes to the study of the Bible. I've heard, you, you might have heard some yourself, and you walk away going, what Bible are they reading? And, but, you know, there's, there's tons of that stuff. Well, this is the, uh, the tomorrow evening, we're going to talk about the, uh, the opposition. Uh, we talked about it, uh, we, we've uh, made mention of it, this proto-Gnosticism that was, um, be, uh, the church in, Eph uh, in the Roman province of Asia was being exposed to, and we talked about it briefly here this evening, and other, in previous evenings, we're going to look at that in detail, and the, the, the title of the message tomorrow is the, dis the, op the opposition described in 1 John, and then uh, uh, next week, we'll uh, finish off the introduction next Tuesday and Wednesday by noting the, the themes First John shares with John's Gospel, chapter 13 through 17, the Upper Room Discourse, which I'm looking forward to teaching. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Uh, John's basically using the language of Jesus in the Upper Room Discourse in First John. Well, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson will be a blessing to your people and go a long way to helping them understand this wonderful epistle so that they can apply it in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.